when Ian asked me to uh, to talk about the National Dormouse Monitoring Program and where it all began, uh, it struck me that it didn't have a beginning as such. Um, it was just part of a whole suite of things that we started doing in the hope that something would work. And um, and so look at where we are now. And so that's what I wanted to take you through for this, which is where it all began, of which um, the Dormouse Monitoring Program uh, was a key part. Uh, are we allowed to turn the, the lights off, do you think, or turn them down? Because I like my pictures showing properly. Who's got the mic switch? Nobody. All right, we get it then. And actually, looking back, um, it, it's extraordinary the state of ignorance that there was not so long ago, you know, uh, and when, when I started doing something, <coughs> I was doing something about dormice, there'd been virtually nothing uh, published on them, um, just a couple of distribution surveys and a little study of feeding. Um, the Handbook of British Mammals, the basic reference source of information, had told us that um, they weigh up to 43 grams. How often do you see a 43 gram dormouse? And look, the information comes from a German who kept his dormice in captivity hundred years before and evidently overfed them. And so, you know, this is this is this is bad news if we can't do, can't even tell us what the average weight of a British dormouse was. <clears throat> and few people ever saw one. I mean all these people going around talking about bank voles and wood mice and their long long with trapping grids and all that they made their careers out of that. They'd never seen a dormouse. Nobody actually went out catching dormice as a matter of deliberate intent. And so, you know, that's that's where we were starting off. And um, the reason, of course, is that you know, if you go looking for dormice, you see nothing at all um, because they're small and nocturnal and up trees. Uh, and actually, they don't go into longworth traps normally. Um, they don't get caught by cats. They don't get caught by owls. All the, all the ways that you might normally study small mammals don't work with this one. So it seemed to me that um, if only we could crack the problem of how to study dormice, the whole field was open. And uh, let's have a go. And so. Um, you know, <laughs> it's part of, part of a radio tracking study of hedgehogs, which wasn't going too well. I spent some time building a trap for dormice, because it seemed to me that if dormice didn't go into longworths, it might be because they were claustrophobic, you know, or it might be because they didn't like sheet metal, or they didn't like grain, or they didn't like to go on the ground. So let's build a bigger trap out of weld mesh, bait it with apples and stick them up trees, and we caught dormice. And so, you know, there was the poss possibility of, uh, of moving ahead. There was also um, encouraging uh, results from the uh, observations of Elaine Hurrell and her father uh, to do with more uh, nut hazelnuts, and you all know that technique, and you also know that uh, when we did the great nut hunt at 1993, we were able to consolidate the surveys that Elaine had done um, some time previously and produce an up-to-date map of the dormouse distribution suggesting that it had actually declined throughout the north of England and disappeared from about half its former range. So there's a little bell ringing there saying that there might be a problem. <clears throat> As part of yet another study, um, I had a student who was looking into information about water bowls, and here you can see that um, uh, Jane was actually scanning mammal reports um, through the decades, and that although there were more and more mammal reports being published, fewer and fewer of them, were actually reporting dormice. And so, again, more evidence, if you like, pointers, suggesting that there was a problem with dormice. <clears throat> and so, we, 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 I decided that we'd actually have a go at doing something about all this, finding out why it was that dormice were rare, why is it that they're declining, or apparently so, and perhaps thinking about what we could do about it. And I got lucky. Um, this is the late Doug Woods, who many of you probably knew, um, he, he was an uh, amateur naturalist of the old type. He'd been a professional butcher, actually, but he'd retired to Somerset and become a very active local naturalist. He found that all mice actually went into bird nest boxes and reasoned that if you put them up back, back to front, you'd actually be able to study dormice. And uh, <coughs> he told me all this, and I didn't believe it, of course. Um, but he took me out one day, we parked the car, we saw dormice, and you can still see my car. And I thought, well, if we can do drive-in dormice, you know, we, we, we're onto something here. Doug agreed to cooperate. We built some more nest boxes, and we began the study of, um, uh, of dormouse biology using them. And I got lucky again with Paul Bright, who um, was the, well, most of what we know about the 
uh, ecology of dawn mice is down to Paul's enormously um, effective um, activities uh, studying the animals down at Cheddar. And so, you know, well done, Paul. I marooned him on a pig farm, actually, where the only thing he got to do was radio track dormice at night and analyze the data during the daytime. Uh, you couldn't escape, and that was a very good way of using your research assistant. <clears throat> So the first thing we did was to try my traps where there were nest boxes. <coughs> and we showed immediately that um, nest boxes appeared to be doing some good. So you know, straight away we got some information there which might be of conservation value. Um, animals were breeding in them. Uh, and also it gave us a tool from which we could start collecting information about dormice. Paul hates to be showing that picture because it makes him look so young, but never mind. Um, we were able to show something, for example, of, of weights, body weights, which is important not just to correct the next edition of the handbook, but uh, also um, because the dormouse as a hibernator goes through a seasonal uh, cycle of, of, of weight gain and loss. <coughs> and, and if you collect enough data, you can then estimate the uh, weight at which they need to reach before uh, hibernation. Otherwise, they're not fat enough to survive the winter. And that's really important because um, establishing that <coughs> dormice need to weigh at least 12 to 15 grams or they're not going to be alive next Easter um, is a way of actually establishing that animals at this time of year which below that, uh, whose weight is below that threshold can be taken into captivity and, uh, and, and used for our reintroduction projects for example um, without actually depleting a, a wild population so that was quite important but, but very simple information for the first time Using the nest boxes also enabled us to start studying individuals by fur, a fur clipping. We actually tried tattooing as well, but uh, it didn't work too well. Um, but fur clipping is a short-term me method of marking animals, which um, doesn't require a license, does mean you can identify individuals and start finding out all sorts of interesting things, which are completely unknown before, in particular, that these animals appear to form pair bonds which you wouldn't expect of a small mammal, because most of them don't live long enough for it to be worthwhile. But um, the dormice do, um, perhaps associated with their high survival rate and longevity, some of them living more than five years. And, and as we began to pick up this information, it was clear that the dormouse is actually a case strategist, different from other small rodents, more in common, having more in common really with the biology of bats than with, with mice and voles. So we begin to understand that the, the dormouse is not just another mouse, it's actually the dormouse is different. <clears throat> so the nest boxes enabled us to study all sorts of things, litter size, um, torpor, hibernation, uh, feeding, uh, all that kind of thing, and radio tracking, uh, enormously difficult on some of our study sites. Radio tracking enabled us to understand how the animals were using their, uh, hi their habitat, and, uh, and we could put this together to form uh, a story, if you like, you know, the story of the dormouse for the first time. And, uh, <clears throat> and from that, we could start speculating about why the dormouse was rare. And from that, added to the information about the ecology, we could start suggesting ways of doing something about it. And that really is the basis for, for the dormouse conservation activities now. <clears throat> well, I got lucky again. Um, there was this bloke at um, English Nature, I've forgotten his name now, but um, he was really very, very helpful and supportive to us in, in the background, in particular maintaining, um, well, I wouldn't say a flow of money, but at least some money um, to, to, to keep the Dormouse show on the road. And in particular, the Dormouse was built into the uh, Species Recovery Programme uh, with great success. <laughs> and we decided that there should be a three-pronged approach to... Uh, Dormouse conservation. We would try and identify key sites, places where dormice actually did occur and where we could all agree, including the owners of those sites, uh, we would all agree that the management of the site would actually be dormouse focused rather than go off on something else which might be uh, harmful. <coughs> um, we were going to try and set up those key sites uh, in all the counties where dormice still occurred. We're also going to try and raise awareness of dormouse issues because actually there's a whole lot of things to do with dormice which 
if you want to understand them, you realise that what's good for dormice is good for other things as well. And so the dormouse is actually a very good example of a, a flagship species. You know, you look after the flagship, the rest of the fleet's okay. And, uh, and we can push that message very strongly using what is actually, of course, a very charismatic animal. It wouldn't work if this was sort of common shrew or something. And so we could use the dormouse then as a sort of publicity outreach um, vehicle for getting important general messages across to lots of people. <coughs> and we would also try um, to uh, set up a captive breeding program which would use those underweight animals to manufacture more dormice to reintroduce them and restore populations in counties, the seven counties from which they appeared to have been lost uh, in the previous hundred years. So that was, that was the, the strategy then for uh, the Species Recovery Programme. And so we set about contacting the wildlife trusts um, to ask them about key sites. And uh, this was really quite difficult. I mean, no, no complaints here about the actual county concern, but Sussex Wildlife Trust, and they got loads of dormice, um, didn't know where they were. And um, they weren't sure about dormice in Sussex at all. Uh, other, other trusts say, yes, we've got them, and they're here, and they're kind of over there. Um, you know, this, there was a lot of uncertainty about where we could have key sites, but uh, nevertheless we, we set them up and they actually became the first of the monitoring sites because the idea was to install plenty of nest boxes which would give the local people an opportunity to see dormice and share their experience with, uh, with others and, um, <coughs> uh, and also start collecting information. So, so the birth of the monitoring program, if you like, was part of the designation and defence of these uh, of these key sites. <clears throat> Choosing them was was a bit difficult. Um, we obviously want to make sure there were dormice present and that the, the, the habitat should be suitable and big enough. And for example, the first time I wrote to the Cheshire Wildlife Trust and says this is what we want, um, 20 hectares plus of suitable habitat, they said there's nowhere like that in Cheshire. And, uh, and it wasn't until the second approach um, that um, we, we settled on a smaller piece of woodland which was connected to others, um, which actually has been, again, one of our really very successful reintroduction and monitoring sites. <coughs> so the National Dormouse Monitoring Programme grew out of this whole idea of defending dormice and monitoring them locally. And of course, once people started seeing dormice and enjoying them, and, and once local managers realised what um, crowd pullers they are, uh, everybody wanted to join in. And so uh, the monitoring programme has expanded very considerably, to the extent that, quite honestly, it was no longer a um, suitable thing to be running out of a, a university department. And I certainly wouldn't be able to get away with that today. So I'm very glad, and actually at the time very relieved, that um, the People's Trust took on um, management of the monitoring programme and, uh, and continue to carry that forward today. <coughs> Without their help, that would have collapsed. And so, as Tony said, uh, the whole thing's sort of grown and grown, and uh, it's really <laughs> quite spectacular. Um, just imagine 17,500 nest boxes, um, 8,900 dormice. Yeah, gosh, can we really claim that dormice are rare? We found 8,900 of them last year. Um, you know, and the box is actually supporting 2,000 plus young giving the mothers somewhere secure in which to raise their families. I mean, this is, this is grown big. <clears throat> People's Trust also took over the uh, production of the Dormouse Monitor, which we started off as a kind of loose newsletter for the, the few sites that um, were, were helping in the beginning. And in the present format, um, the format which was developed, um, there's this table, uh, this diagram, which enables you to compare site with site. Because what we're doing here is not calculating dormouse numbers in total, but an index of abundance, the, the number of dormice per 50 nest boxes. So you can compare everywhere um, with everywhere else, in theory anyway, um, whether you've got 50 boxes or 200 of them. And so those, those charts enable you to look at them and say, oh, look at this, this one's doing pretty well and that's my site. Oh, they've done slightly better, but what about these ones here? We could actually look at the ones which are actually apparently not doing too well and ask ourselves why is it that they're not doing too well? What is different about some of these sites compared to some of the others that are doing spectacularly well? And that then be begins to point us towards 
identifying key things that differ between sites and perhaps um, indicate where management might be usefully applied. <clears throat> so that's one very good use, use of this. But, but I ought to point out that um, uh, right at the beginning we weren't very strict about this. We said we want you to put up at least 50 nest boxes. We'd like you to put them up in a grid. But not everybody did. And um, quite a few who, who sites which started off really with the intent of supporting as many dormice as possible and showing them to visitors, that kind of thing, um, they could take their 50 boxes and go and put them up in little batches with 50 here and there's a good place, there's another good place. So they'd be scattered in little groups uh, in the best sites, the best habitat in the wood. And that's what, in some cases, probably accounts for these spectacular successes. What we ought to be doing, if we're going to have comparisons, proper comparisons site to site, is to make sure that the uh, 50, 50 or 100, whatever it is, nest boxes are actually set up uh, in the same kind of pattern, the same sort of grid, same sort of spacing uh, as on uh, all other sites. Otherwise, comparisons are not scientifically uh, very valid. Never mind. It, it's, uh, it's been very successful and people enjoy looking at these, uh, these giants to, to see where they're at. <clears throat> you can also now, after a few years, start looking at various other complicated questions to do with change over time. And um, you can see here, uh, this looks like the numbers are going down. So, damn it, you know, we're doing all this for the dormice, giving them nice nest boxes, and their numbers are still going down. What's the matter with them? So we need to think about why it is um, numbers appear to be still going down despite what we're doing. <clears throat> we also have to reflect on the fact that individual sites have extraordinary variation from one year to the next. And so you can't generalize based on just one site or even a small sample of sites. We need lots of sites. They need to be widespread um, to overcome this difference, this uh, problem of variability year on year. <clears throat> but nevertheless, you start analyzing the data, you can see what we should be doing next. Um, you can also think about, uh, well, you can think about graphs like this. So. If, if, you've got, if you've got an apparent decline, um, then think about why it might be. And I think it's a very strong possibility that um, the dormouse is actually a species, well, we know it's a species of the understory, of the woodland edge, the shrub layer, all that. And perhaps some of these sites, over the 20 years of the, of the monitoring program, have now grown into more mature forest, which is a less suitable habitat because uh, uh, the shrub layer is actually being... Um, shaded out perhaps <clears throat> by the more mature trees and so maybe these declining graphs are a pointer to the need for uh, a more active form of, of management and we should be thinking about that and the value of the monitoring program having gone on for 20 years is that we can actually accommodate the fact that woods take a long time to change if this had been a phd study done in three years um, you know we'd have got nowhere and certainly wouldn't have any long-term uh, vision of what was happening. And so, you know, the 20 year span is really important to understand how things change over uh, a woodland scale of, of, of time. <clears throat> I wonder too whether, um, looking at this, the monitoring as we do it now, uh, we might think about some other criteria. So after all, what we're trying to do is to say, was this a good year for dormice? Uh, how does it compare with last year? How's things changing from um, the south of England to the north of England, you know, that kind of, those sort of questions, and maybe the number per 50 nest boxes is not the only um, criterion we could look at. And I wonder whether we could look at things like litter size. Um, litter size may very well differ in the north of England compared to the south. Um, <clears throat> we would have to actually adjust, of course, for uh, considerations of age of young and so on. Um, it may be that some years are good for, for breeding and others less so, so we might look at litter sizes by region, by year. Um, maybe we could also look at autumnal body weights, because again that might be uh, indicative of um, good years and bad years. And perhaps we should also be paying more attention to the effects on the dormice of, of the disturbance that we ourselves cause by monitoring the nest boxes. So, you know, these are issues here which I think um, uh, would certainly merit further thought and perhaps um, uh, some actual uh, investigation. And certainly we've got plenty of data now um, that some of that could be addressed already. <clears throat> Maybe we could be looking at other species too. Um, and in particular, we get yellow neck mice in boxes. 
but of course they don't occur everywhere in Britain. So there's actually some quite important and interesting questions about the yellow neck mouse, which remind me of just the sort of problems we were having when we started the dormice. Maybe we could learn more about this species as well, riding on the back of our dormouse work, and also look further at the question of uh, competition for uh, nest sites and nest boxes. I know that's been done in some places, um, but uh, the more data, the better. <coughs> But while we're doing all this, uh, people sort of say, well, why are you focused on the dormice? It's only just because it's a twee animal. Um, you know, this is sort of 1960s type conservation, save the panda, save the tiger and everything. And so I think we should be ready to defend uh, our focus on the dormouse on the grounds, as you see here, particularly that what's good for dormice is good for other things. And on the whole, the sort of places that are good for dormice are the kind of places that anybody, you know, even your average walker in the countryside would recognise as being a nice place. And so the Dormouse is a very important focus um, for our approach to the appreciation of woodlands. <clears throat> so I, I, I don't feel the least bit defensive about focusing on Dormice. I think we can uh, very strongly make the case that what we're doing is we're doing the right thing. Then we get people asking about climate change. Um, what about, what about, what's, what's climate change going to do to British wildlife? And of course it depends very much on um, what form climate change actually takes. <coughs> but we do know that the, the dormouse is actually very sensitive to climate, both directly, because temperature and rainfall directly affect their activity at night time. Another one of our studies um, showed that I think it was uh, uh, for every one degree colder at midnight, the dormouse will shorten its activity period on average by a quarter of an hour. So four degrees colder at night, and it's an hour less feeding. And so, you know, that's, that's a direct effect of weather. There's also the indirect effect that um, uh, long-term weather patterns across the whole season will affect the availability of um, insects, availability of nectar, pollen, and all the rest, flowering times, and so on. And so, um, you know, the dormouse is a very sensitive thing here, in a way, actually, that mammals shouldn't be. The whole point of being warm blood in the mammal is to be independent of, of, of the environment to a greater degree than, say, insects or lizards. So the dormouse is actually quite an important thing here as part of the discussion of climate change, but uh, we don't know what the sort of changes there will be in the future. All the more reason, then, to be collecting the data now so that in the future you can see what changes have occurred as a result of a um, climatic shift of one kind or another. So, um, good question, are we doing the right thing? <clears throat> I think it's implicit in what I've just been saying, but we do, we do need more sites regionally, and particularly in the parts of the country where dormice are rarer and where they might be uh, under serious um, pressure. And I think back to the map of distribution which shows the extraordinary isolation of the sites in Cumbria and Northumberland. You know, if they, if they die out there, then the Dormouse's range shrinks by about 200 miles. And, uh, and yet one of those sites seems to have had no records of Dormice lately. And so they're, they're perched on the edge of what's possible. So should we actually abandon them and say, well, you know, they've had it, it's a natural change, or should we try to reinforce those sites and focus on bigger activity there? We should certainly be making more effort around the edges of um, Dormouse distribution further south. <clears throat> we need to have a standard layout, as I said earlier, if you're going to make comparisons between sites. Um, we should be setting things up on grids. There is a bit of an issue about um, nest box spacing because studies in uh, Lithuania suggest that um, the numbers of dormice you get in your boxes rather depends on how much the boxes are spaced out, which is very embarrassing. And um, so we might just forget about that for a while and, uh, and just say, well, what we should be doing is irrespective of, 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 the prob of that problem, we should make sure that we should all be doing the same thing, which is spacing boxes at approximately similar distances on all our sites, not having some sites with boxes at 20 metres and others at 100 metres apart. And of course, we do need the support of volunteers like yourselves. This whole thing wouldn't work without the enormous amount of effort that people put into this unpaid and in their spare time. 
And so uh, it's, it's wonderfully um, encouraging to see everybody here today. You know, there was a time when you know, we had an international meeting on door mice and we could all have met in a phone box, actually. You know? and, and look at this, we've got 200 people here. And so you know, it's, it's really good that we've got that degree of enthusiasm. What we need to do is to make sure that goes forward and, uh, and, and keeps the whole thing going. And in the meantime, for those of you who've been at this for a long time, thank you very much for your support. And on behalf of the Dormice, thank you. Um, and also take heart from the fact, that, as I keep boasting, um, the Dormouse is still the only terrestrial British mammal that's monitored every year. The bat people do what they can, of course, but that's not a terrestrial mammal. Um, <laughs> Various other monitoring schemes go on, so a patch of leaf, you know, every few years, now and again, bits of the country, yes, 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 but we do it nationally every year. And that's important too, because some of us struggled endlessly to try and get a national monitoring program off the ground for mammals as a whole. The way they monitor birds, and have been monitoring birds for more than half a century, the way our government has committed Britain to monitoring its wildlife, that's what we should be doing for mammals as a whole, and at least for Dormice, we're showing the way. And thank you very much for that. <laughs> Where's your five-minute badge? You forgot. <laughs> you didn't look. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Pat, for that very neat history of Dormouse studies in Britain and the history of the monitoring scheme. It's also recent. You know, nothing before in our lifetime, Tony. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice also to see the English Nature logo again. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we have a few minutes in hand for oh. uh, questions, just one or two. But Pat, oh, uh, somebody start the day off. Yes, up here. Right. Um, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, and our strategist, the opposite, if you like, is, is an animal who, whose life um, strategy is, is based upon the idea of producing as many, many offspring as possible, uh, as often as possible, betting against the laws of chance that some of them are going to survive um, and keep yourself, your genes going into the future. Um, a K strategist is one who produces fewer offspring at longer intervals. Um, so there's less per year, if you like, less productivity, but balances that by living a longer time um, in order to have several goes at breeding. So if you compare dormice living five years and breeding once a year, um, you're getting the same kind of productivity, perhaps, as a, as a wood mouse or a bankroll, which might live only six months, but have a couple of litters or more in that time. And so it's, it's just two different ways of going about things. And, and, and you, you can look at this across animals and mammals and birds across the world, you know, there's those different strategies and, of course, every gradation in between. There's nothing wrong with either of them. It's just a K strategist breeding slowly is not going to be able to respond very quickly and build its population up again if it's been subjected to a serious impact, like, say, a forest fire or something. Um, mice and voles will recover numbers quite quickly within a season. With door mice, it might take a decade. And so, because they breed uh, relatively slowly, and so case strategists on the whole are much more sensitive to um, uh, abrupt changes in uh, in things, and um, uh, and we see that with you know birds of prey and, and other things too. 